devil is on his way. Devil is on his way, motherfucker. Oh, the devil gonna make you pay. Fall to your knees. Devil is on his way. Fall to your knees. Devil gonna make you pay. Fall to your knees. Devil is on his way. Motherfucker. Mountain Murders is an Appalachian true crime podcast. Some content may not be suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. We say fuck a lot. Hey y'all, welcome back to Mountain Murders. I'm Heather. And I'm Dylan. And let's thank today's sponsor, Wendy, a.k.a. Gwendolyn, our brand new patron, sponsoring today's show. Yes, thank you very much for your support. And you can sponsor an episode too. All you have to do is sign up at patreon.com slash Podcast. And it's a win-win because you get loads of extra content. I think they know what it is now. Yup. We've talked about it enough, Dylan. I feel like we mentioned it they a time wanna, or two. They want to support the show that they will or they won't. <laughs> it's true. They will or they won't. Yeah, actually, we had a listener ask us if we can make some merch that says it will or it won't. Apparently, she has been using these uh, this terminology, this phrase for the past week at her house until her family is like so tired of hearing it. <laughs> really? So they're like telling her to shut up. Wow, I'm totally proud of that. Yeah. That's one of my uh, acolytes or mm-hmm. is it what is it, accolades? No, that's an award. Um, it's one of my disciples. Yeah. I'm going to go with disciple. I'm buying you a thesaurus. <laughs> okay. I just covered a lot of ground right there. You did. Mm-hmm. And I have to say over the weekend, we had an interesting visitor to our area. Chinese spy balloon. That big old balloon went right over the Mountain Murder Studio. It did, and I have a feeling the Chinese government was trying to catch a peek of Dylan smoking in his underwear. No, seriously. But they were disappointed. Let's flesh this out, because people are like, oh, is it the you know m- nuclear missile silos in Nebraska or Montana, or is it HARP in Alaska? What are they really looking for? And I think we've figured it out now because they did go directly over the Mountain Murder Studio and they are trying to get a peek at the next week's episode before the public does. You think that's what it is? Crafty. I think they want to see you in your underwear, Dylan. And they very well uh, can see me in my underwear smoking a cigarette if they stay near my house for more than an hour. They want to gaze upon your seductive body. (laughs) Wow. Yeah, it's true. Well, I was going to say I am. High-ranking members of the Chinese government have heard your voice. Oh. They have heard tale of your very big head. Wow. And they want to see you. They want to they want to catch a little peek of you, Dylan. Well, I do love the Chinese. I mean, there is that. So, okay. Well, um, thank you. I'm part of the Politburo, uh, apparently. The what? The Politburo or whatever. You know, the the uh, council, you know, the communist council or whatever. Okay. I don't know how to say that word, but somebody out there knows what I mean. I'm sure they do, Dylan. I'm I sure they do. Just realized something. Once I got home from work, blah, 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 I am full of unbridled enthusiasm today. I mean, it's just brimming over the top. Yeah, I know. It's really getting on my nerves. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, I just got brought back to reality. Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah. You know, I did think nobody could bring me down, but here we are, back at the bottom. Yeah, but when you say unbridled enthusiasm, all you do is sit in here and, like, slurp on your monster energy drink in the microphone, again, making these weird dad noises. It's not okay. I simply took a drink. It's assaulting my ear, my eardrums. Nobody wants to listen to your slurping. And if I n- didn't know that it would aggravate the living hell out of you, I would give an example to the po- uh, listeners. Oh, but I'm not gonna. Please don't. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna refrain. Please because don't. Nobody can bring me down. Stop today. trying to confuse unbridled enthusiasm with sucking down a monster energy drink. Well, those are um, sometimes connected. They're not. Yeah, they are. They're not. And that is not the first one I've had today. I believe it. And then you wonder <laughs> why you're probably going to die in a week. Oh, no, it's not true. They're good for you. They have what? good stuff. It says it's, it says in the ingredients, good stuff. One day your prostate is just going to like fall to your body. It's like, uh, it's going to tap out. It's going to be like, I can't. Yeah, it's just going to drop out of your body. Okay. 
and be like done. And it's because you drink Mountain Dews and Monster Energy drinks. So you say, I'm going to see my prostate on the sidewalk with a stick, with a kerchief, a few essential items tied up in it. He's heading to ride the rails. Like a little poke. Yeah. He's got a poke. He's going to pick out a hobo name. He's gone. He's got a can of your baked beans. He's going to jump a train that is a very short line that goes absolutely like only six miles. He's going to find someone who drinks water. Okay. Yeah. He's like, wants a new body. Somebody's going to drink water. Who would ever treat him like that? I know what he wants. I drink water. (laughs) (laughs) I give him what he wants. He doesn't want the monsters. I don't want the monsters. Okay, enough about my prostate. I never thought I would have to say that. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you're the one that talks about it all the time. So, yeah. Okay, so what's your real thoughts? Uh, Since you did bring it up, and this is not political, it's just something uh, that everybody's talking about. Um, What do you think about the Chinese spy balloon? I think it was fucking spying. <laughs> what do you okay. mean? What do I think of the Chinese another, spy balloon? Another pointed question. I was disappointed when they shot it down and it didn't release a shit ton of confetti. Yeah, or candy. And my other thought when they shot it down was like, oh great, now there's some sort of weird biological warfare that's going to be released in our country. So somebody's going like, I know they're going to shoot it down. I know they're going to shoot it down. Shoot. Yes. Yeah. My pitch at the meeting made it and it has worked. Right. So when people's eyeballs start like melting out of their heads and they're shitting blood and they turn into like a weird mutated zombie eraser head baby creatures, it's because they shot down this fucking balloon. It's like the last of us up in this bitch. I don't know what that is. Okay, here's that's a new series on HBO. I told you about it like four nights in a row. I've told you about this show and you refuse to acknowledge it. It was a very popular video game and now it is a Show on HBO. Okay, you said video game, and I just checked out. I did not play the game, but I like the dude. Because it's the guy who plays the Mandalorian. Look, baby, I love you, but we do not have the same taste in entertainment. Oh, I'll watch it by myself. Good for you. So here's my thought about the balloon. Okay, for one one thing, they say there's uh, other ones. There's one over South America. There's multiple sightings of these exact same yeah, types well, of balloons. Yeah, well, I was reading online that, like, there were two or three discovered during Trump's administration flying. Yeah. Up. So they've been doing this. They said they briefly breached our airspace in those uh, instances. So in this this one, okay, so it's like you shot this dude down. I've been trying to You, do you this. shot down this unmanned aerial surveillance vehicle of some sort that actually had a, a very heavy payload under it. Uh, approximately the weight of three uh, buses. School buses. School buses. Is what I was reading. And uh, But it already done its job, bro. You let it like drift over everything, and then you're going to shoot it down. And then it's like, well, we can't shoot it down. It might hurt someone on the ground. You can't pick a field in Montana or somewhere where, or a national park or something. I mean, it's already done its job. And then you're going to shoot it down. You know, what? it reminds me of like if someone comes and causes a big old problem or whatever where you're at and your people's at and then they they turn to leave like they've said their piece, they've caused their problem, done what they've wanted to do. And then you're like, oh, yeah, well, you know, you better keep walking. That's what exactly it reminds me of. Well, the Chinese are saying it was a meteorological research vessel. They're saying it was a, a civilian and, weather instrument and, that got blown off and course. And they are very displeased. And we will, uh, we reserve the right to do something about it, is basically what they said. But they're all about intimidation tactics, so this doesn't surprise me. Heather, me and Heather actually uh, disagree on this. She has a military viewpoint of this because she was in uh, the military. And uh, actually participated in war games and helped craft some of that. And uh, she said the opponent in those games was uh, were China. Uh, oh wow! Is it wait? Is this classified information? No, you can go. Oh, so the boat. Okay, you can. You can talk about this outside well, the boat. You can look up the the like joint exercises okay. and shit. It, uh, it's not boat talk, Mac. No, it's not boat talk. Okay, so she said, and 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 it doesn't. A war between, if something was to happen between the U.S. and China, she could see it happening. I personally think we're too intertwined through trade and other interests to uh, actually get into a real war. I think this amounts to a saber rattling 
much like North Korea when they, uh, you know, launch their missile three feet and they're like, ah, I'm going to kill you. Um, and I think it is a weapon of mass distraction. And because this is one of those things that captures the national conversation for two or three days, it is literally everywhere. The memes, the jokes, the yucks and the whatevers and the like trying to figure out what's going on. What is it? Uh, the, and, uh, and they're doing something. They're doing the real shit behind uh, closed doors. They probably passed some legislation at one o'clock in the morning last night that was totally fucked. And we're talking about a balloon. That's what I think. So you're like, okay, with foreign <laughs> entities spying on the United States. No, I'm not okay with that at all. And I'm not okay with them letting the balloon drift across the entirety of our country before they made a move. Okay, so what's the point at that point? That's why I think it is possible. It is not the real story. It's not the real story. Okay. And I could be wrong. Well, we'll see, Dylan. Well, for one, China imports like 90% of its food that it feeds their citizens. That is a lot of food. And the U.S. is one of the major leaders, and the other top two or three are direct allies of us. So instantly, they would be high, be behind the eight ball. But You're it, trying to act like they want to fight us, like it's just going to be some... You know, that's the whole point is we're just going to go to war with each other. These are people who want to, like, literally fucking take over this country and want to, like, seize our resources. So I just disagree with you completely. Anywho, moving on, because we've been rattling on about 10 minutes with oh, nonsense. okay, that worked So then. let's yes. go uh, discuss some true crime. Okay. Can, can we do that now? That is why we showed up, and that's what we're going to do. If you want to talk... Chinese spy balloon and conspiracy theories and intense political stuff. We need to have a different podcast. It's true crime time. Let's go. You put the balloon back in the cupboard. Brian Charles Kosas was born May 28th, 1962 in Fairbanks, Alaska, before his family settled in Larksville, Pennsylvania. Now that is quite a transition from living in Alaska to Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah, I would say that it would be a bit of a culture shock. Michael Kosas, Brian's dad, was an eight-year Air Force veteran who took a job as a USDA food inspector, offering his family a modest middle-class lifestyle. Brian was active in church, serving as a youth deacon. Reportedly a good student, he was a Boy Scout until earning the rank of Eagle Scout by the time he turned 17. He graduated from Wyoming Valley West High School, where Brian won a national photography competition. He was then accepted into the prestigious Rochester Institute of Technology, where he studied photography. From 1984 until the mid-1990s, Brian worked as a biomedical photographer at Pugalee's Eye Care. Brian left the medical photography industry to briefly attempt of wireless communications. Um, he wanted to do cellular phone sales, but wasn't that good at it. Man, uh, sales is not easy. Now, if you're good at it, you can make a ton of money, but we were actually talking earlier, like you have to be a certain type of person to it, to really make good money at that. He was not really cut out to do this. And by 2001, he had to file bankruptcy. Although he owned his home, Brian had around $220,000 in debt at the time of this bankruptcy. It was also around 2001 that a closeted Brian began living outwardly as a gay man, though his family continued to be unaware of his homosexual lifestyle. It was around this time that big changes came to the adult film industry as videotapes and DVDs were becoming the way of the dinosaur and more adult content was being pushed to the internet. Uh, you know, some people say that's what really solidified the internet. And I do know for a fact that's what decided the war between DVD and Blu-ray, the formats. Uh, I think we all remember when, you know, they're kind of pushing one or the other at the same time was which one porn went with. Isn't that interesting? After filing for bankruptcy, Brian opened his own cottage adult film business called Cobra Video. Brian quickly became one of the most successful producers of underground gay pornography in the United States. Most of his money came from filming, quote, twinks. Oh, what is a twink? They are young men who are 
the age of consent. So they are of age, but they don't look it. Oh, okay. So they just look like very young men. And Cobra focused on the young men Brian found attractive. So he's into this. So these are the kinds of actors he wants in his movies. They're under 21, clean cut, hairless, thin men and boys. Mostly white boys and men. What differentiates Brian from other pornographers was his lackadaisical attitude toward condoms. A veteran porn producer named Kevin Clark would say Brian Kosas on, was only interested in getting into the pants of young men and that filming sex without condoms, which was called barebacking, was clearly out of the debased mind of a predator, meaning that Brian Kosas was a predator. Oh, wow. That's a pretty strong accusation. Clark stated that a good businessman would protect his young performers, especially since at the time that we were talking about, back in the early 2000s, nearly 50% of all gay porn performers were reportedly HIV positive. Wow, that's a staggering statistic. Bareback was considered kind of niche content and not mainstream at the time, though it was growing in popularity. Yeah, but if that number's anywhere near accurate, I mean, you really are rolling the dice if you uh, if you show up as an, uh, a sex worker or performer. You're really rolling the dice if you uh, engage with someone without protection. Wow, that's amazing. Absolutely. Well, Kosas, who had been described as a recluse, spent hours online trolling for young talent. In the early days, Kosas would log on to AOL chat rooms. Do you remember AOL oh, chat yeah. rooms? Of course. That's where it first went down, right? That's Did you ever find yourself in an AOL chat room? Yeah, I mean, nothing. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, know, you go in and just the fact that, I mean, at that point in time, it was just cool to be in a chat room and you get in there, you kind of fumble your way in, you know, and, uh, and then there's people just actively a real time talking to each other. It was the coolest thing. Yeah, I remember the AOL chats and then the Yahoo chat rooms. Yes. And they were all like specialized or you could kind of pick if you wanted to talk about movies or like swing dancing or music, dating, what have you. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the very early version of uh, what we have now. But yes, yeah, it, it was no different. Between May and June of 2001, Kosas met a 15-year-old boy in AOL's male-to-male chat room. The boy had sent nude photos to Brian Kosas, and the pair agreed to meet up under the premise that the young man would be willing to work for Cobra Video. Kosas picked the boy up from the South Whitehall Township area. Some said that Kosas groomed the boy, offering him work preparing mail orders for the gay porn videos that Cobra video produced. Well, even that would be inappropriate. I mean, a kid, I don't think a 15-year-old should have any connection or job in an industry like that. Well, the boy would later say he had sexual contact with Brian Kosas, and it was videotaped. One other occasion, <clears throat> Kosas showed the boy a pornographic video and then gave him a soda. The boy claimed to feel drugged, and that's when Kosas led him to the bedroom for like another sexual encounter between the two of them. Now, in Pennsylvania, the age of consent is 16. So when Luzerne County investigators were contacted by the boy's parents, Brian Kosas was the subject of intense scrutiny. A search warrant was executed on July 12th of 2001 at Brian's Midland Drive home. He was charged with statutory sexual assault, aggravated indecent assault, involuntary deviant sexual intercourse, sex abuse of a child, and unlawful contact with a minor. It was ultimately the boy's parents who contacted law enforcement reporting the crime. So during the investigation, neighbors reported boys and men coming and going at all hours of the night. Others had described Kosas as an average suburban neighbor, quiet and kept to himself. Others said he fit the description of a pornographer, always wearing ball caps and aviator shades, Gave off a creepy vibe and seemed arrogant. <laughs> it's the aviator shades, I'm sure. Yes. Now, can I ask you a question? 
What do you... I, even if I say no, you're still gonna. So what is it? Oh, yeah, I was It's asked... probably gonna be the most random question that I won't have an answer for, but go ahead, Dylan. No, this is a, this is a, <laughs> this is a really good question. Okay. And I was literally answering it before you had a chance to answer or asking it. So I'm sorry about that. Well, how, what do you think about the age of consent in a lot of states of being 16? Do you think that's too low? Do you... I, I have a personal opinion about it, but or do you think it should be higher? <clears throat> I think there are extenuating circumstances. I know what you mean, and I think this uh, aligns perfectly with my view. It's all about how the ages between the, the two age, people. The difference. Yes. Because if a 16-year-old is dating a 17-year-old who then turns 18. Going on 18. Right? Right. And then it's like, oh, well, this 18-year-old has taken advantage of this 16-year-old. Yeah. Then that's not necessarily, in my opinion, true or a reason for there to be, like, charges pressed and that kind of thing. No, and some state laws uh, about this very thing really don't consider that gray area properly, in my opinion. And there were people listed as self, uh, sex offenders that were just having a relationship amongst basically their peers. A year or two or whatever, I mean, that that is someone, it's a window that I think you should, I don't, I don't think that's the same as a 44-year-old trying to holler at a 16-year-old. No, not right. at all. A 32-year-old and a 16-year-old, a 20-year-old and a 16-year-old. I mean, that becomes murky to me. Like, oh, yeah, much over about a year and a year and a half, two years is my cutoff. if you're still in that, like, 16, 18 kind of area, I, I do find that to be a bit of a, a stretch to be like, this 18-year-old is a pervert. <laughs> you know no, what I'm two years is my cutoff. I mean, for the most part. And the age of consent, I mean, I just don't even understand what the purpose of that age is because you're still not an adult. You're not recognized as an adult. Can't even buy a pack of smokes. No, you can't vote. Can't vote. Um, you're barely, well, I don't think 16-year-olds should be driving by themselves, honestly. I think that should go up to 18. Well, I agree too. But um, a lot of countries do that and they have a lot of safers and the statistics are better. Everything's great. Um, that, you know, it really blows my mind that, you know, like recently, uh, I'm sure everyone remembers they took smoking back up to 21 away from 18. Okay, cool. Um, not that it matters because every single kid my daughter goes to high school with, they're all vaping. And I'm like, where do they get these vapes? Well, dude, that's just like, you know, because um, she's always, she she makes fun of all these kids who walk around with their vapes and act yeah. like they're so cool because they're vaping. Yeah, and they're just addicted to nicotine and fruit juice, basically. And I'm, and I'm always like, where do they get these vapes? So you can't just go buy one nowadays. I mean, it's, you have to be 21. That's like when you have the cashier bow up on you, like, do you have ID? And a lot of times they're directed by their bosses to ask everyone. No matter if you're uh, under the age of a thousand, they're going to ask. You know, if you're obviously many years past 21, 18, or whatever. I love to get carded. And they do I these show them things. my crow's feet, and then I'm like, thank you, you just made my day. But you go near the middle school to pick a kid up or something, and the kids are like, literally have one foot still, or not even off school property, and are lighting up, and like cops see them, and they don't do anything about it. <laughs> so I'm like, why in the hell am I getting reamed at the convenience store because I forgot my wallet and I'm damn over 40 years old and this kid's smoking right in front of you not doing a damn thing about it bud what's wrong with this system I don't know okay back to the story it's, uh, okay well, Th well, thank you for I guess your... thank you for asking me well no but I thought it was a good discussion yeah yeah it wasn't stupid, was it, Heather? Well, I just want to know when the neighbors are like, no, he looked like a pornographer. I'm like, what does a pornographer look like? Yeah, I thought that too, but when you said ball cap, aviator sunglasses, and probably like a member's only jacket, like a tan one for some reason is coming to mind, and he just acted creepy, I was like, that sounds like a pornographer. Does it? Okay. <laughs> Not really. I'm just... Uh, I guess uh, I imagine a, a guy who wears his shirt like unbuttoned all the way down so you yeah. can see like his loaf of chest hair sprouting out. You're and it doing has, like some sort of gold, shiny gold necklace, you know, like maybe an Italian horn uh, charm or something on it. Anytime you use the turn of phrase, Got slick back hair, like he would look like uh, the Jesus from the Big Lebowski or something, uh, you know, like the John Tutoro character, but with like the slick back hair and. You know, he'd probably have like some little creepy mustache. 
do you know this guy? Because that's getting pretty detailed. Maybe. Whenever you say loaf Look, of chest hair, it grosses me out. I was young, and I needed the money. Don't judge me. And that is nothing against anyone who has a hairy chest or what all that. Um, but just the word loaf of chest hair is just weird. It just it seems like a lot. You like my chest hair. <laughs> You're You're always running your fingers through it. <laughs> I braid it. You always coiffing it, putting mousse in it. You like want it to be fluffed up and curly. It it's is cool. properly coiffed. Yeah, I know. It's pretty. Neighbors were shocked to learn that Brian Kosas was making pornography and distributing it from his home, which I find funny considering half of them were like, no, he looked like a pornographer, but then are surprised he's making porn in his it's house. Like, uh, everybody's talking about how he looks like a pornographer <laughs> because apparently there's a look and you can tell. And and I'll, and he's creepy and all that. Yeah, and everybody else is like, he just wears khakis and like polo shirts and looks like the most normal dude on the planet. Yeah. So I think that's funny. Anywho. Others were even more shocked by the allegations that Kosas was a pedophile. Though technically, Kosas was considered an ephibophile. What is that? It's an attraction to post-pubescent adolescence. Yeah, that's still a pedophile to me. Well, it is, but I mean, technically. Oh, there's been intense discussions around this very thing, pre-pubescent and post-pubescent. And in the latter category, um, if I'm not mistaken, these men or these people who feel this way um, claim or feel like the post-pubescent child can consent if they want, if they're into it, if they like it. It's what they want to do. And you get into a really weird area at that point. And, and we are getting into a weird area. Because I mean, this is like Nambla shit you're talking like about. This is like Brian's thing. Okay. Now, regardless, during the search, a tiny micro DVD cartridge was found stuffed in a legal Cobra video. It was a video of the sexual encounter between Brian Kosas and the minor. Just anyone and it who was, goes around calling themselves Cobra, I cannot take them seriously. Well, that's just the name of the video company. Still. He doesn't call himself Cobra. Oh, oh but still Cobra. Come on, bro. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, the video is exactly as this teenage boy described it, like the encounter. And the video matches up. So clearly the boy's not lying. This happened. It's exactly as he detailed Oh, my gosh. Michael Kosas ended up posting the $75,000 bail to get his son released from jail. Kosas took a plea deal in April of 2002 to the charge of corruption of a minor, which carried no jail time, and he didn't have to register as a sex offender. It was proven that the boy had repeatedly lied to Kosas about his age. He was also reluctant to testify at trial, which was another setback for the prosecution. In the end, Brian got a year's probation. But at that point, the cat was out of the bag. Okay, so there's a literal video of this. Yes. Correct? Um, but it was proven that he lied yeah, about they his had age found to him? The, there were the e they had exchanged emails. There were transcripts from these AOL chats that were pulled up where the boy is repeating like, in messages that they were sending, I guess, like AOL instant messenger and that kind of thing where the boy repeatedly told him he was like 18 or above. Okay. Now, well, how does that make you feel? Does that change your view of this? Or do you stay, think he still should have done his due diligence? I need a state ID. Let's be professional, blah, blah, blah. I think you should. Well, he should, but it sounds like this was a sexual encounter and that this video is not going to be, this was like a personal video. Oh, okay. This is not a video made to be distributed like, under Cobra video. This was an encounter that Brian had filmed like for his personal spank bank or whatever. Oh, I'm sorry. I was confused if the listeners would probably know exactly no, what's I'm going on. No, I'm glad you cleared that up because yeah. Okay. Um, so no, it wasn't like he was trying to make pornography with this boy. This was like an encounter. He filmed it. It was on a little micro card. It was like his personal video. This always, I can never... This is going to be like a triple nigga. I can't never not think about Tracy Lords when I hear anything like this. Because was she underage? Certainly. Was she anyone around her or in the profession or in the room with her was like, huh, if you think she was the victim, she was in full control of everyone in, in her orbit. 
And she played that shit like beautifully. Oh, yeah. I've done like some extensive research into the Tracy Lord yes. case and I've read her book and I've read other books. There's a Legs McNeil had a book and I think it was called like the oral history of porn. And it's like all these different stars kind of yeah. retelling from their perspectives, different stories. And everybody who worked with Tracy Lords is like uh, she was more professional and like ahead of the game than like any grown person. Yeah. It's just, it's very tricky to get into, right? Well, this arrest seemed to change Brian Kosas. He became guarded. He didn't allow unexpected visitors to pop by his house. Even family wasn't allowed to drop by without warning. He was like really guarded about like having people over. Well, hold on. That's strangers. normal. Strangers. Don't just pop over to my damn house, bro. <laughs> right. Don't you dare pop over and knocking on my door. Because if you come knocking on my door and I haven't asked you to come by or you haven't texted and say, hey, can I, I'm going to come by. I'm concerned because I don't know what the hell is going on now. Who is this weird, strange person knocking on my damn door? I don't play that shit. Speaking of, I had a weird visitor yesterday. <sighs> Marcus. Yeah, some <laughs> random guy knocks on the front door, and of course Rufus is going nuts. And I don't know this person. Well, you've got to say we have a full glass front door that we have not put a current on, but it's just like if someone's standing there and you happen to come down the stairs, it's just there in your face. Exactly. And he was like not budging, and I didn't want to open the door because I'm like, I don't know you. That's my purse. Get away. But I finally like kind of opened the door, and I was like, Can I help you? And he was like, Yeah, my buddy used to live here. Um, and he seemed confused. And I said, well, I live here. And I don't know you. Yeah. And he was like, my name's Marcus. And then he was like, I just stopped by because I thought my friend might be here. And I'm walking a very long distance and wanted to know if maybe I could have like a bottle of water. What the fuck? <laughs> so I okay. lock the door. I go in the kitchen. I, I dig around in the fridge and find one of the propels that we didn't like, like the no. watermelon flavored or something. Look, guys. The patron saint Heather here is like, okay, dude, I can give you a bottle of water, which is cool. I would do this too before I send him on his way. She goes and purposefully <laughs> digs in the <laughs> bottom shelf in the back where she knows that the waters that we realize we don't care for get pushed to and digs out of flavor from the back. You And there was other water easier access, correct? What, on higher shelves well, in the front. What's wrong with that? <laughs> I don't like the watermelon propel. Uh, you don't like it. No yeah. one's drinking it. This guy's like, beggars can't be beggars choosers, can't be right? Choosers. So I'm going to give him the damn watermelon propel and get it out of my way because that shit is nasty. Marcus can suck down that watermelon propel. <laughs> so then I, I go outside. I'm about to take Rufus on a walk when this transpired. So I go out. I give him the water. I lock the door behind me. I've got Rufus. We're like starting to walk up the street. He turns down our driveway and goes to our back, like, kitchen door. Side entrance. Because we have, like, four entry points into this house. Wow. Are you a tourist? <laughs> yes. Some people only have one entry point, I'm just Heather. saying. <laughs> so he's at the, like, back door, I, you know, like, the kitchen just door. Just chilling. And he's knocking on the door. No. And I was like, Ex what are you doing? <laughs> Excuse you. Well, this is the side of the house my friend lived on. And then he's, like, explaining to me something about it being an apartment. And I was like, sir... My husband and I live in the house. <laughs> we have kids. It's just us. It's our family. This is our whole house. There's not an apartment in this house. So I don't know what you mean, but your friend does not live here. That is not your friend's door. And this is my house. Get to stepping. Yeah. I mean, I was kind of like, bricks, Marcus. but I was trying not to be too bitchy because I thought, I don't know this person. Watch him pull out a fucking gun or something, right? Then he leaves some weird towel by the door. Yes. And then I start walking in the opposite direction of him because he's kind of going up toward Main Street. And I start walking down like I'm going to take the block around our house. So he's on this uh, this incredible foot journey that he's already um, yes. admitted to. But he still does He seems to have issues with like... Walking the fuck away, right? right? Now he's still lingering. He's just sort of loitering in front of the house. This is a no loitering zone, sir. I know. So I kind of go around about way. Well, I end up seeing him up on the main street 
Mm. And he like sees me again and I'm uh-uh. walking the dog. Oh, like, now you I, guys are friends. And at this point I'm on the phone with you because I'm telling you like there's some fucking weirdo. If I go missing or die, it's probably this guy. <laughs> and he's like down the street, but I see him like looking at me, like trying to figure out where I'm going. And I'm thinking, is this guy going to go back and break in my house or something? Anyway, it was really bizarre and I didn't like it. He doesn't know who he's messing with. I'd be like, look, dude, don't make me call the Memphis police over here to kill your ass. Oh, shit, is it too soon? Okay. Okay, let's go. Enough. I'll, I'll stop getting yeah, You better, because I'm, I'm... But I'm just saying, like... I'm devolving. I don't like some rando, like, just <sighs> knocking on my door and not leaving. No, and that totally uh, went Maybe with... I feel very uncomfortable. Yeah, and our listeners know that. And our listeners don't play either. Well, a true crime fans don't play that shit. You can go, We, you know what? Go down the street and sell that because I ain't buying it. You know well, what yeah, I'm saying? Like, I'm going to lock the door. I'm watching <clears throat> you like a hawk. How many times I got to tell you that um, whoever the fuck you're looking for ain't here? Yeah. And uh, you're on your incredible footpath journey. And um, years ago, like somebody you knew might have lived to just keep it moving. Bud. And try it, motherfucker, because you don't know that I'm crazy and I have weapons stashed all over the house. Oh, long time listeners know for a so, fact that you have ordinary objects that can kill in plain sight. Stat- you, you've already planned these My out. whole tree. I just stabbed somebody on one of the big horns on my whole tree. Look, right quick, Heather, for, for <laughs> newer listeners. Go over this right quick, and we'll get back to the story. Your your weapons, your death weapons that you have. I know one of them is a little statue of a bird, and it has a very sharp beak, and it fits right into your like your little palm just perfectly, like it was made for it. Like a little knuckle, and you're just knuckle. You're going for the fucking eye with that bird, and it just sits there in the kitchen looking like cheery and shit. I got machetes and hatchets and jewelry alls that are sharp and pointy and. I'm telling you, man, I got shit stashed everywhere. <laughs> Marcus dumb fuck. Sometimes no. I'm like, I wish a motherfucker would just so I could prove to y'all that I'm, that there's a reason why I got these weapons and that's beneficial to me one day. The reason that even though we have all these oddities So and when I tell shit, you things like put that table, le- that wooden table leg down. Leave it where it's that, at. That broke off of a table. Leave it. Where it is. There's a reason why it's on top of the fridge. Oh, I found out very quickly that like <laughs> we have all this weird oddity stuff or cool stuff and stuff. And there's here's this little kitschy, uh, knickknacky grandma's like little bird, little uh, dark green bird. And I'm just like, what is this? And I would like move it and Heather would be like, who moved my bird? Where's my bird? It's like right by the door on the shelf. I'm like, uh, okay, why do we even have this? What, what is this? Is this sentimental? And she's like, no, that's my weapon. In case I got to pop a motherfucker in the face, I'll and do I, it. And I got it for a quarter at okay. Goodwill. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Let man, this is good. Now, a former actor who worked with Brian Costa said he was really a nice, smart man, and that there was nothing sleazy or stereotypical about him. Oh, so he was your unstereotypical porn producer. So when people are like, "Oh, he was such a greasy porn producer," this guy's like, "No, he was professional. He seemed nice. Like he was smart. He didn't dress outrageously." It's the aviator shades. I've never trusted a man or woman that wears aviator shades. And if it's a dude with a mustache, bro, come on. Dude, I totally had a pair of aviators back in the day. That doesn't surprise me. Still wearing my cowboy hat and my Burt Reynolds (laughs) t-shirt. However, his next door neighbor complained about the number of male visitors to Brian's home between 2 and 3 a.m. And how often he had loud sex in the jacuzzi, which was located below her bedroom window. Ooh. Shut your window and quit listening. Yeah, put in some damn, put on some white noise. Put in some headphones. Put on some white noise (laughs) that can cover up. Oh God, oh God, don't stop. My mom has neighbors across the way that have a jacuzzi, and there's been more than one occasion when we've seen glimpses and heard them. Oh. Yeah. Like heard them going at it? Yeah. I don't like in the water sex. Do you? And they're like my parents' age, like my mom's uh, age. And well, I'm just hey, always hold on con- now. And I'm always like, uh. They still can love. I, but I don't need to see glimpses of this man's body, okay? Wait, do you like in the water sex? Because I think it's weird. 
I don't want to talk about this right, right now. Let's keep it The moving. porn industry was offering Brian Coase success despite his arrest. Now, Brian's home was paid off along with two land parcels, which were paid in cash. He also owned a Maserati convertible, a BMW SUV, and an Aston Martin. Kosas had a fine wardrobe. People said he dressed to the nines, though every picture I've seen of him, he's in just like khakis <laughs> and a polo. And he sported a Rolex watch. Wow. Yet by industry standards, Brian was virtually unknown. Most pornography is made in the San Fernando Valley, California. And it's distributed by like large companies such as Titan Media at this time. Yeah, Brian had little overhead, so the money that he was making went directly into his pockets. Oh, so he, in, in 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 their eyes, he's uh, much smaller, uh, just a non-factor. But in reality, he's making a lot of money. He is, and he's got kind of this niche, right? Like this barebacking young boy looking performers, and yeah, so he's making a ton of money. The 2001 releases of films like Casting Couch 1, Austin's Beach Buddies, Outdoor Boys with a Z, <laughs> Ethan's College Buddies, and Campus Boys 1 and 2 were all released under the name Brian Phillips. And they were very successful for Cobra Video. So he wasn't using his real name. So the adding the Z on there really dials it up a notch, don't it? It does. I feel like someone's wearing a Von Dutch hat, like, to the back or to the slide. <laughs> In this video, Brian befriended a Cornell University student named Robert Wagner to act as a model. But eventually, the two kind of got to be friends, and Wagner became a second cameraman and helped with other areas of the business like the 2257 forms. Now, the 2257 forms, Dylan, were a very important part of the age verification process. All models had to provide proof of age in a valid ID form and or birth certificate. Okay. Part of Wagner's responsibility included picking up models from the airport and checking their proper IDs before filming commenced. So this is the, the professional due diligence to make sure everyone's safe, above board, consenting adults. Because as you mentioned, Dylan, after the Tracy Lords blow up in May of 1986, in which authorities learned the adult actress had been underage when appearing in porn movies... It sparked a federal crackdown on child pornography with very stiff penalties and prison sentences. Stiff penalties. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Honey, you knew the story was about porn and I'm trying to be good. It was the summer of 2003 that Brian Kosas began an internet chat with a young man named Sean Lockhart. Lockhart was only 16, but dating a 21-year-old man who had encouraged him to get involved in the adult entertainment industry. Sean Lockhart used a webcam to send nude photos to Brian Kosas and said he would be 18 on October 3rd, which was actually his 17th birthday. Oh, damn. Yeah. Brian could hardly resist. This boy was a dead ringer for teen idol Zac Efron. And not only was he gorgeous, but he was well endowed. Whoa, hold on. So we're talking Zac Efron bod and face with a packing some steel. Reportedly a seven and a half inch penis, which I guess is a big deal. I don't know. Well, hold on a second. Seven and a half? This is, I mean. I don't, I'm just telling the story, Dylan. Okay. Okay. Can I'm I sorry. finish? I'm sorry. There is no, I don't even know what I'm, what I'm saying because You're not the what judge standard? And jury of what well endowed means. Okay. And this boy was willing to do whatever for the camera. Oh, okay. Well, that's, okay. So this dude is just like, what? This is a perfect performer. By February right? of 2004, Costas agreed to fly Sean Lockhart to Fort Lauderdale, Florida to film scenes for a movie called Every Pool Boy's Dream. Before his arrival, Costas informed Lockhart he would need to provide an ID. Lockhart sent a photo of a Washington State driver's license and an Idaho birth certificate that he had photoshopped to reflect an adult age. Yet, when he arrived in Florida, Sean couldn't produce a photo ID, explaining he must have left it at home. Oh, yeah. That, come on, dude. Uh, he didn't fall for that, did he? Wagner, who usually handled the 2257 forms and kept those IDs on file, informed Brian. Brian said he had seen the ID online 
and we can just get this information from Lockhart like the next time we see him. Oh, he goodness. can bring us the birth certificate. He can bring us the ID. He's just like, wow, this guy's perfect. This is going to be awesome. He's already seeing some dollar signs. Okay. Now, those who <laughs> knew Lockhart back in San Diego, his hometown, described him as a cunning young man, wise beyond his years. Quote, Sean has all the elements of a lovable villain, said Jason Seacrest, host of an adult radio show in Los Angeles, speaking to Rolling Stone magazine. He compared him to Catherine Trammell, the main character from the film Basic Instinct. Damn. Due to Brian's insistence on an ID, Lockhart paid $200 for a fake ID, eventually sending the fake ID to Brian Kosas. Kosas wanted to get Lockhart in on a contract deal, which offered him the industry standard of pay, which was about $2,000 per scene. In April and May of 2004, Kosas and Lockhart worked together filming Schoolboy Crush in La Jolla, California. According to Lockhart, Kosas kept tabs on him the whole time and wanted to control his every move. These titles. Brian Kosas, because, you know, Lockhart's making him a lot of money and he wants to kind of keep him happy. And even though he's got him locked into this contract, Lockhart want, wants more. So at one point, Kosas signs over a 2004 Volkswagen Jetta to Lockhart as part of his pay. Okay. Kosas came up with the name Brent Corrigan for Sean Lockhart. That, if you're making up a name, I mean, that's just, I don't know. Is that a good one? Because I would be like Pistol Pete or I'd be like Buck Naked. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Well, Brian thought it was a great catchy stage name. In 2005, Brent Corrigan won a nomination for Best Overall Gay Video with an actor named Brent Everett from the Adult Entertainment Broadcast Network. With Kosas, however, Sean was filming only a few scenes per year. As Brent Corrigan, Lockhart felt, I'm leaving money on the table. Oh. Though he was paid, as I mentioned, about $2,000 per scene, Kosas was clearing about $2 million a year. Kosas was enjoying sex with the young actor, which was what he considered another perk of being director. Yeah, but he's, uh, what do they say? Um, he's shitting where he eats. And that, I know that's a Krause statement or a uncouth statement, rather. Um, but, you know, it's just, it's unprofessional. You're just asking for trouble, really, honestly. Brent Corrigan's fan base expanded. Only one month after signing the contract with Brian Kosas, Sean Lockhart was back in San Diego with his now boyfriend, a man named Grant Roy. Sean Lockhart wanted to strike out on his own, but Brian Kosas laid claim to the name Brent Corrigan, even going as far as filing a trademark patent on the name. So he's, now it's, fell, they've kind of had a little bit of a falling out. Well, but they he, really haven't had a falling out. Okay, but he's basically like, when it comes down to it, I made you. I created all this that you're enjoying, and I should have control of it. Yes. Okay. And you're under a contract with me. I've created the stage name for you, like Dirk Diggler or that, see, Johnny Dirk, Wad. See, those are great. Right? Not like Dennis Oleander or whatever the hell his name is. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny Wad, dude. Dirk Diggler. Are you kidding me? These are great names. But then Sean gets away from him and is like, well, I'm doing well with this Brent Corrigan name and I like it. It's working for me. I should be able to just use this name. Fuck this guy. Fuck okay. this contract. Oh. I mean, that's his attitude. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, I just got seven and a half, dude. What? Well, his boyfriend, Grant Roy, encouraged Sean Lockhart to break away from Brian Kosas. What happened next was... Then a bitter legal dispute between the actor and the season director. Sean Lockhart continued using the name Brent Corrigan. Brian Kosas filed legal action against him. Sean Lockhart threatened to blow the lid off everything, explaining to Brian Kosas that he had only been 17 years old and a high school junior when the pair started a professional relationship together. See, now you found yourself uh, and I'm, um... It seems like he tried to do, you know, the due diligence, finding out, make sure he's an adult and all that. But now you shouldn't even gotten this relate. You shouldn't have this relationship either. You should have kept it, you know, 
a professional in that respect. But now he's just like, whatever, I'm going to do what I want. He's got some a little fame going and stuff. And uh, <clears throat> what do you think? You think he should, I mean, he's the performer. Well, I think he's a brat. Well, he sounds like a, a bit manipul- it's a manipulative. It's a little Madonna. Yeah. But and a diva. And I don't like him. But oh. you'll, you'll learn more about why well, I don't like him here soon. Yeah, this story really uh, gets weird. Well, there's a nasty internet fight that erupts between the two after the legal action is taken. Sean Lockhart accuses Brian of stealing his MySpace passwords, messaging <laughs> friends and family members, um, just saying all kinds of crazy, like... Thing, sending video clips. He photos. changed. He changed my music on my page, man. On yeah. my MySpace. He changed dude. my top eight. Hey, look, MySpace was the shit, though. <laughs> no, for real. Like you could personalize it so cool. It was so cool. In 2006, Brian Kosas released two films featuring scenes with Brent Corrigan, and the titles, Dylan. What? Take it, <sighs> lay it on me. Fuck me raw. Whoa. And take it like a bitch boy. Damn. Both which featured what Lockhart considered degrading cover images. Oh. So it was pretty clear at this point that Brian Kosas is like, oh, yeah, you want to be a little shit? I'll show you. And names these films like these, you know, very different titles from like (laughs) Ethan's Beach Boy Adventure, right? Yeah. And is putting this super degrading photo on the cover. It's not glamorous or elegant or it's portraying this Brent flattering. Corrigan in a good light or making him sexually appealing. I mean, it's like... Starring Jerry Oleander. It is a very, very, very triple X kind of photo on the cover. So it's really like, I don't even care what this does. I'm just like a thumb in his eye. Can right? I, yeah. Okay. Brian Kosas... Um, his attorney blamed Sean Lockhart for the whole ordeal and argued that the young man had committed fraud and feloniously obtained a fake ID to appear um, of age in the videos. He had lied to Brian Kosas, who had taken the ID at face value. Sean Lockhart blamed not having a father figure in his life and claimed that Brian Kosas had groomed him. <sighs> forgetting that he was the one who reached out to this guy saying, I want to be a model in your videos. Yeah. <laughs> And you produce fake IDs, you lied about your age. Yeah, that's not okay. That's not okay. In August of 2006, Sean Lockhart appeared in a Falcon Studios movie entitled The Velvet Mafia. Whoa. And he was using the stage name Fox Rider. Hey, see? That's better. But Ryder wouldn't stick for long. Despite the legal issues, Grant Roy and Sean Lockhart launched a website, BrentCorriganOnline.com, in October of 2006, offering paid subscriptions to the site. So, OnlyFans before OnlyFans. Okay. Yeah, people used to have their own websites. Yeah, I remember it, back It's in going the day. back to that. It should. Yeah. Cut out the middle, man. Well, no, seriously, like, why do I have to go through some huge platform like you, YouTube take or something? Eight or fifteen percent of my, pers- you know, my and earnings, and tell me what I can do. All you got to do is make a daggum website on GoDaddy and, and put it out there. I don't need that. Yeah. By January of 2007, Kosas's attorney was ironing out a settlement with Sean Lockhart, a settlement which would still guarantee him some profits from Sean Lockhart's work. The third week in January, Brian Kosas had traveled to San Diego for business, but returned home to Dallas Township, Pennsylvania. For several days, Brian Kosas had been exchanging emails with a young man named Danny Moylan. Moylan was like a dream come true. Fresh-faced, smooth skin, and naive. Just the way Brian Kosas liked them. What the hell? The first email arrived at 10.18 p.m. on January 22nd. Moylan sent photos, and Moylan expressed that he was interested in working with Cobra Video, but didn't have much experience and might need to be taught first. Oh, that's a great line. That's all Kosas needed to hear and immediately set up a meeting. Moylan asked if they could be alone the first time, to which Brian assured him they would be alone. See, dude, what are you doing? Here he goes again. Kosas told him to pack an overnight bag with plans to stay the night. Stuff it full. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just living my best life. This is great. This is a weird story, though. 
And I'm just, I'm, I'm sorry. I can't get over the fact that they're just so, both of them are so, I want that name. Like, it's the greatest one ever, dude. Calm down. It's, it's it not, sucks. Yeah. Let's be honest. Johnny Watt's so much better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, God. Kosas was last seen on January 24th at 2.05 p.m. picking up food from the Really Cooking Cafe, where he was a regular customer. I want to eat there. Brian sent an email with his address, 60 Midland Drive, to Danny with a time frame of 7 to 8 p.m. for their initial meeting. No one knows what happened next. At some point that evening, Brian Kosas opened a bottle of wine. His blood alcohol level would indicate that he'd had about two drinks. Brian showed Danny a room in the house there were no signs of forced entry, no struggle, and nothing to indicate that Brian felt threatened. It was around 9.45 p.m. on January 24th, snow flurries falling all around 60 Midland Drive, when neighbors realized the house was on fire. Uh-oh. Neighbors reported the house burning. Less than two hours after his meeting with Danny Moylan, Brian Kosas was dead. He had been brutally hacked to death. Kosas was lying in a fetal position on the leather sofa with his head nearly decapitated. His hyoid bone, trachea, and left carotid artery and left jugular vein were severed. He had been stabbed another 28 times in the chest and abdomen. His body was charred with second and third degree burns so badly investigators needed dental records to ID the victim. State fire marshals and homicide detectives spent two days combing the rubble with investigators on their hands and knees sifting for clues. My God, that's this a burned out house. Horrific attack. Under the sofa was a small razor knife. Brian's wallet was on a nearby table with $60 cash. There was also keys to that BMW SUV were readily available. So investigators ruled out the possibility of robbery as a motive. Kosas, who had been paranoid, had guns stashed throughout the home. In a kitchen drawer, $1,800 in cash was found, along with two wine glasses, which were discovered in the kitchen sink, suggesting that Brian had a guest. A, bro ah. a broken wine bottle and cocktail shaker were also discovered in the kitchen. Heat from the fire had destroyed latent prints and made DNA hard to collect. <laughs> Are you laughing? Yeah, uh, the listeners don't know, but uh, Heather's being accosted by uh, Rufus right now. He's literally <laughs> climbed up and is like sitting on my shoulder almost yeah. like a parrot. It's not enough. He wanted to come in. We had to stop and let him in the studio. And, and that's not enough. He went directly and stood beneath Heather and looked up at her. And, and stoically until she picked him up and now he's in the lap and you're like, okay, cool. You're in the lap. Let's, let's get, you know, let's finish this up, bud. No, nope, not enough. No, he climbs up <laughs> my body and is now sort of perched halfway on my shoulder. And I can't tell if he's sad or if he's content, but uh, let's just, let's just keep it rolling. No, he likes this. This is like his favorite spot. Oh my gosh. <laughs> there was nothing around that investigators could see that would accidentally cause a fire. They considered it a homicide and an arson investigation. Dr. Consalvo, the pathologist, determined the neck wound was the cause of death, the manner homicide. And as I mentioned before, Brian had burns on 80% of his body, like now, second and third degree burns. I was wondering if it was the 200 stab wounds that made them think this might be a homicide. What the hell? Robert Wagner had been one of the last people to see Brian alive. He was flown in from New York City to look around the house and determine what might be missing. Wagner immediately spotted two computer hard drive towers that had been in the dining room where Brian had an office set up. They were gone. The two, I'm sorry, the 2257 forms were also missing because he kept those in like a very specific file folder type right. of thing. It's important. And Brian's Rolex, which had his initials engraved on the band, like inside, was gone. There was also a fireproof safe where there were um, three mini DV tapes that contained master images of all the porn he was producing. 
those were gone. So these are like the masters. The masters. The originals. They're gone. And a missing fourth tape would later be discovered in Virginia Beach. I've never understood people to spend uh, inordinate amounts of money on like watches. I don't get it. I don't either. If I had 50 bajillion dollars, which is a lot, I would not buy a $10,000 watch ever. Ever. One, I don't really care about what time it is. <laughs> I'm trying to get away from that shit, and I got a, And I got a phone that tells me, so oh I haven't worn God. a watch probably since the damn 90s. <laughs> when it was swatches, right? Back in the eighth grade when I had like a Mickey Mouse watch. Dude, if I had a swatch, <laughs> I'd wear that shit. I'll buy you a vintage swatch for Valentine's Day. Will you really? If you want one. So investigators felt this was a planned hit, an execution likely carried out by professional. Cyber analysts went to work, invaluable in building the case, Dylan. There was lots of cyber evidence to sift through. 72 hours of web traffic to the Cobra video site needed to be examined along with all of the emails. Brian's sister, Melody, had known more about his business than other relatives like his parents, and she also agreed the computer towers were missing and those 2257 forms, which uh, she knew as well that he kept in a very specific place. And what what year is this at this point? This is 2007, okay. very early 2007. She told law enforcement those records needed to be permanently maintained and that her brother had been a stickler for keeping them handy, especially after his previous run-in with the law. Right. Cell phone calls to and from the victim just before and during the time frame of the crime were instrumental in providing a specific roadmap to suspect activities. A Florida-based webmaster who helped with Cobra Video was able to pull up the last contact Brian had online. And the last contact had been with a potential model named Danny Moylan, who said in an email that he lived in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. Photos and an application to Cobra was submitted on January 22nd. The email used to contact COSAS had been tracked to an IP address in the Virginia Beach area. A witness in the neighborhood reported seeing a light silver SUV parked in Brian's driveway just before the fire. So this Moylan or Danny characters claiming he's from Pennsylvania, but the IP address tracks back to um, not Pennsylvania, correct? Mm, to Virginia. To Virginia. Law enforcement officials now had a photo of this Danny Moylan, which they released to the press. Citizens were asked to help identify the man in the photo who had been using this fake name, Danny Moylan. Well, it didn't take long for a tip to roll in from the Norfolk, Virginia area. The man in the photo was a Navy veteran named Harlow Raymond Kuandra. The tipster passed along information about Harlow's MySpace page and also a gay escort site called BoysRUs.com. B-O-I-S-R-U-S. Boys are us. Because I don't want to grow up. I'm a Boys R Us kid. And there's also a porn site that was sent called boybatter.com. <sighs> Boy batter? Yes, yeah, Dylan. Okay. This is a sticky situation. <laughs> Curiously enough, Kuandra had posted photos on MySpace of a recent trip to Las Vegas where he posed with none other than Cobra video star Sean Lockhart, a.k.a. Brent Corrigan, a performer discovered by Brian Kosas. Okay. <laughs> this is such a wild story. Now we're getting into it, Dylan. Yeah, and this has been this horrific murder. And they try to cover up their tracks with the fire. You know, typical. Okay. Two weeks before the murder, Kawandra and his boyfriend, a guy named Joseph Kurekis, Kur Kur had met with Sean at the Bellagio in Vegas for dinner and drinks. Harlow proposed going into the porn business together, offering Lockhart $20,000 for their first movie together. Of course, Sean Lockhart and his boyfriend, Grant Roy, indicated this was a great deal, but the only thing standing in their way was a man named Brian Kosas, who currently owned the Brent Corrigan name and had the performer locked into a contract. Thanks, Ruth. And I feel exactly the same way. So, and, and I get it's more about, it's, it's about more than the name. You've created this kind of a... Um, 
back catalog. You've got some traction. You're, you know, you recognize some fans. So, I mean, I know there's way more to it than just the name, obviously. It was discovered the email used to contact Brian Kosas had been created and used only in the days leading up to the murder. It was created around 4 p.m. on January 22nd, which was just hours before that first email was sent to Brian. The initial email was written as though it was from the point of view of a teenager. Okay. Yeah. I saw you in your aviator sunglasses, and I just want to be a part of what you're doing. I think it's beautiful. I think it's very artistic, and I think I want, you know, let's do this. Well, it's more like, I would like to meet you, but it's just the letter U. Oh, <laughs> capital. That's, I mean, you know, it matters. All of this led police and those in the gay porn industry to question whether the teenager Sean Lockhart had arranged to get Brian Kosas out of the picture. And there are people who are still asking this question today, Dylan. So the tongues are a wagon at this point. Another performer who danced with Sean Lockhart at clubs in San Diego told Rolling Stone magazine, quote, Sean doesn't have any humanity. Sean had a God complex. He puts on the facade of an innocent child, but he's wise beyond his years. Tell us how you really feel, dude. Harlow Raymond Cuandro, we need to talk about him, Dylan. He was born in Miami, Florida on August 5th of 1981. He lived with a single mother trying to do her best to raise four kids on welfare. Living in poverty, the family struggled until 1985 when his mother remarried. However, things were not good for Harlow. His stepfather fixated on the young boy. The sexual molestation would last for years until Harlow joined the Navy. Even after he shipped off for boot camp, his stepfather would write him love letters in Spanish. Okay. It was one of the letters discovered accidentally by his mother that revealed the horrible nature of what had been going on for years. In January of 2000, while working as a hospital corpsman, that is when he first meets Joe. Joe's an escort. Harlow, by now, had been discharged from the Navy and was trying to go to school to become a medical technician. Yet, there was little money to be made while going to school, so Joe got Harlow into escorting as well. The male companions started their own escort business. The two spent hours at the Big House Gym, a dingy but private club where Harlow would later film his first solo gay porn scene. The Big House Gym? I would be an escort. I would take people to like the dollar store and stuff. I'd be like, if you go on the family dollar. You're just going to escort them to stores? Yeah, I'll escort you on errands, you know, and be like good company while you're like paying your lot bill and shit. Okay. Yeah. And plus, I know where stuff is in our local dollar store. Uh, I know where, the, I know the aisles, bro. That's not what this is about, Dylan. Oh, okay. See, I'd be a great escort is what you're saying. Sure. Uh, let's talk about Joseph. Kareckes. He was born December 30th, 1973 in Butte, Montana. His father had been in the Navy. Joe was raised in a strict Pentecostal household. He considered becoming a pastor himself, having gone to seminary for three years, or so he claimed. He then joined the Marine Corps, but was kicked out due to anger issues. Harlow became the primary breadwinner of this relationship. The bulk of the money he made, he was earning as an escort. Now, Joe was a little older than Harlow. So he's getting a little older. He's not as hot and buff and good looking as his boyfriend, right? Yeah. So, of course, when people are like shopping for dates on this website, they're attracted to Harlow because he's very handsome. Okay. Right? And they're not so much interested in like this middle-aged, the middle-aged guy. Yeah, he's going to get you there in a very comfy, reliable sedan. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, Joe had also worked as an escort, but Harlow was in high demand. Now, their website boasted military and college studs, but Harlow was the primary escort. Joe was incredibly jealous, and their relationship was volatile at times. At one point, Joe discharged a 9 millimeter inside their home during an argument. The men decided the real money was in producing their own pornography, so they created a website, boybatter.com. Models were paid very little for their work on the site, like around $50 per shoot. What? 
Joe spent his time building their website and building up this porn business, which meant that Harlow had to work even harder as an escort because now he is the primary breadwinner. Yeah, he's going to sway back that poor boy. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Overwork a horse until it has a sway back. Yeah. The pair lived this very earn it and burn it lifestyle with money going out as soon as it came in. Joe had Rolex watches, a $6,000 chinchilla coat, wow. a two and a half carat diamond earring. They owned a BMW M5, a Corvette Z6, a Dodge Viper, a Honda S2000. How many cars you need, bro? The men needed a daily income of $3,900 to keep their personal and business accounts afloat. $3,900. Per day. Yes. They had maxed out cash advances on their credit cards and had a second mortgage on their home. Joe's father would later say he knew they were, quote, out of control with their spending, but didn't realize it was as bad as it was. Well, look, you're doing this thing and you're, you're obviously you're making money to get into this predicament to get this far out there. You're making real money. When, at what point do you just between each other like, look, this is untenable. We've got to rein this in. Let's be a little more responsible and we can t continue to make good money. I mean, that's just totally ridiculous. Their website was bringing in between nine and $10,000 a month in DVD sales. Harlow had about 150 regular clients. But again, Joe viewed the escort work as cheating. Yeah, see, the fact that he's jealous and it's not just the, I don't think, I think he's jealous of uh, the fact that he's um, getting older and, and you know, kind of losing a step, if you will, with people. I think if people were like flocking to him instead of the the uh, the other dude, um, that he would be okay, more okay with. It. Does that make sense? I think he's just jealous that he's not the one that uh, people are like fawning over. See, I'm not sure that's the case, Dylan. I think that he he and Harlow genuinely seem to love each other. Okay. And I think it was difficult for him to see his boyfriend, his lover, going out with strange men, entertaining them, sleeping with them. He was jealous. Well, I understand that. And I could never do that. I, I could never um, let the person, uh, I would not be okay. And some people are okay with that. This is a very toxic situation because they both, they love each other. And. You know, this jealousy was a huge problem, but yet they knew they had to continue on because of the money that they needed. That's exactly what I was about to say. They've ended up in this situation where they can't just say, look, if the escorting is like causing a problem in our relationship, let's just not do the escorting. I'm okay with that. They need the money. There's no way at this moment they can afford financially to stop it. Which is a tough place to be in. It is tough. Now, law enforcement officials quickly began looking into the pair for Brian's murder. However, they treated the case as a money laundering scheme rather than a prostitution ring so they could use, like, RICO charges if they needed to. Okay. During their investigation, law enforcement discovered there had been a similar knife attack on a man named John Ross in Virginia. Now, Ross had originally owned the escort service Boys Are Us. That's a great name, I gotta say. And employed Joe. Joe wanted the domain name and ended up taking it from Ross. Ross had been viciously attacked by a knife-wielding suspect who was never caught. So basically, they strong-armed this guy into giving them the website. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Now, you, in, in the... Nowadays, you know, people hold or people ransom or harass people for what they call these OG right. Twitter names. We've talked about this right. in the past, and it, where it's not a bunch of letters or numbers. It's just, you know, a straightforward yeah, I know, short and name. And they get into swatting and a bunch of crazy shit. Yeah. But we're not talking about that right now, Dylan. We're talking about Boys Are Us. That's a great, I'm sorry. That's a great name. It's a great pun. It is great. Law enforcement ran into a problem. See, due to the geography of Brian's business, it was hard for investigators to conduct interviews. Since Brian worked with people all over the country and the bulk of the porn industry was in the San Fernando Valley, investigators hoped that something from Brian's past could help them solve this crime. 
In February of 2007, a search warrant was executed on the home of Harlow and Joe in Virginia Beach. Now, after this incident, the men sold some of their diamonds for cash and left town for three months. Okay. So that's not strange. Well, that's not weird at all. Hey, the police have raided my house, but you know what? We're just going to go to Florida for a couple weeks. Does anybody want to whatever. buy this 30 carat diamond earring? I got in early January of 2007, Harlow had reached out to Sean Lockhart about working together. The plan to bring Brent Corrigan to their company would infuse at least six figures, they estimated. Sean Lockhart mentioned there was this adult video news expo, the like AVN expo, right, happening in Las Vegas, and anyone who was anyone would be there. Sean encouraged Harlow to attend. He was like, well, if you're really serious about getting into porn and starting this business, you got to come to this event. You need to network. Make connections. Yes. Yeah. Joe and Harlow, even though they barely could keep the bills paid, they head to Las Vegas. Um, And in the book, which I'll talk about later, Harlow basically had to be all like, please, daddy, let's go to Vegas. And coerce his his big daddy Joe to like break off some money. Even though he knows they can't really afford it right now. Yeah. I would take you to Vegas. If you asked me to, you know, told me just like that, like you wanted to go to Vegas and I knew we couldn't afford it, I would take you. That's a lie. That's no, not a lie. <laughs> it's probably not because you're always like waving like bill money at me. Yeah. And you'll be like, fuck this bills. Like, let's go to Michigan or whatever. Too bad we got to pay rent. And I'm like, Michigan, let's go to New Orleans. Anyway, they had dinner with Grant Roy and Sean Lockhart at Le Cirque, which is inside the Bellagio Casino. It was during that meeting that Sean Lockhart suggested Brian needed to be killed, at least according to Harlow and Joe. Okay. Joe would later insist the couple didn't really need Sean Lockhart to make money. Yet during the meeting, Joe told Grant Roy about the couple's financial troubles and how they were close to losing their home. He made it clear how desperate they were to sign Sean up on a video deal. Sean Lockhart had his own stipulations about money, um, and they kind of kept going back and forth until he agreed that he would take $20,000. Okay, like a signing bonus? Yeah, like I'll make money with you, but it's going to take twenty grand to get me there. Okay. And this need to eliminate Brian from the picture. Like, sure, I'll do this. And yeah, 20 grand. But first, this guy's a problem. So he's like, I'm on board. We can do this. They're already, the couple is already thinking that this uh, uh, cash infusion in the six digits is desperately needed. And, but the only thing stopping us. And this is what Sean's telling them, right? Right. The only thing stopping us is Costas. 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 Costas, sorry. Back in Virginia, an elaborate plan came together to get Brent Corrigan away from Cobra Video. Three days after their Vegas trip, Joe and Harlow posted images on boybatter.com about their meeting with Brent Corrigan in Las Vegas and teased a possible collaboration. Okay, it's going to get boy battered. <laughs> Sorry. Somebody's going to get battered. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, so they're putting it out there. Put that big dick. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know. Oh, see, so you can make all the jokes and innuendos, but I can't. Well, I'm saying he's no John Holmes. You know, he's dragging a bat around, bro. A Louisville. Nobody wants that. <laughs> She's like his... T- I was like a Margaret Cho said this joke. I'll never forget. She said one time, she's like, that's just like uh, ordering a sandwich. It's way more sandwich than I'm going to eat. You know, it's got extra sandwich now. I'm, I'm not butchering the joke. But anyway. Yeah, what are you going to do with all that? Yeah, what are you going to do with all that extra sandwich? It's probably not even going to like fully do what it needs to do. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you can just be. Well, no. See, that was a problem with John Holmes because I have extensively researched vintage porn. <laughs> I bet you have. Uh... No, I mean like reading and watching documentaries and that kind of thing. Right. Because I just find the whole industry. I think it's interesting. Oh, no, it's great. Is that people would say that John Holmes. Yeah. He had like this huge. Wank. This huge. Wanker. You know, what Look. do we call it? A wang? A ding dong? A this wing is a wang? cock. This is a slog. 
Look, I'm sorry. I, I didn't. I tried. I went this whole show not said the word cock. He had, this is a cock. He had a foot long. Yeah, dude, he it was like five, sixteen. He had bro. like a five dollar foot long or something. Okay, whatever. It's like the original. But the actresses <laughs> would talk about which I mean, part of it was that he was seriously on drugs, but that it just didn't fully. It didn't fully. It didn't get really hard. Yeah. Just say it, Heather. Right. That's because the damn thing needed a blood transfusion from the blood well, bank. Well, right. To get so I'm just up. saying, well, then you got this big dick, but it's not like <laughs> doing what it needs to do. Yeah. So, I mean, what would be, that didn't seem fun. Yeah. And in the shadows, you know what's waiting in the shadows for this, this disappointed. This sort of big, weird, limp thing that's just sort of <laughs> trying to like poke you. I don't know. That just doesn't sound fun to me, Dylan. And, Sorry. And after this woman is we like. We just lost like 100 listeners. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah, let's just move on. I'm not even going to say what I was going to say because it's stupid. Huh. On January 20th, Harlow used his Discover card to order a background check on Brian Kosas. And he used this information for like an address and that kind of thing. Harlow then created a Yahoo email account <laughs> to send messages to Brian. He applied on Brian's website to be a Cobra video model and sent along several sexy, suggestive photos. Within 48 hours of contacting Brian, Joe and Harlow were in Pennsylvania. But before this, in Virginia Beach, Harlow rented a silver Nissan Xterra SUV using his credit card. It had his name, Harlow Cuandra. It's my credit card, right? Right. And I'm going to go rent a car and put the car in my name. Yeah, and I want the sports package, these, bud. These, <laughs> well, just leaving this trail of evidence. <laughs> yeah, I know. They drove the rental car about a mile and a half away to a place called Superior Pawn and Gun, where they bought a Sig Arms model FX1 SG lock blade folding knife, <sighs> along with a Smith & Wesson 38 caliber revolver and some ammo, and again, they paid for this with Harlow's Discover card. So he rented the car in his name, his credit card, drove uh, less than two miles away and bought a murder kit <laughs> and paid for it with, again with his credit card in his name and his ID. A hundred percent. Oh, and bought a gun. So that's how that works. Before leaving town, Harlow activated a prepaid cell phone to use when communicating with Brian. Then the couple drove 377 miles to Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania, where they checked into the Fox Ridge Inn and they paid for the room in cash. Man, you know, cops got crafty with that, like, because you got to do have burner phones and stuff. What these cats do, which I think is very smart, is they go back, they track the damn store down, and they'll find the surveillance. And they get the surveillance of, of who like paid. Walmart, where somebody's yes. got a truck phone. Who paid at that moment for that item? Yulp. And boom, there you are. Yup. Looking dumb. Brian received a call from Danny, again, using this prepaid cell phone. And the cell phone pinged only about 500 yards away from Brian's house. Okay. Joe would later state the men had a job to do. Harlow went to meet Brian around 7 p.m. while Joe stayed behind in the motel room. Between 7.50 and 8.12 p.m., Brian... Kosas was dead, and then soon after, a neighbor reported the fire. In the days following Brian's death, an officer ran the Xterra rental plate that was still parked at the Virginia Beach home of Harlow and Joe. It was a direct link to the vehicle reported by a witness at the crime scene. They still have the rental car they used? Yes. <clears throat> okay. When the SWAT team raided the home with a search warrant, two cameras were discovered with serial numbers removed. And these were like professional cameras that had belonged to Brian. Well, some very expensive. Yes. In the meantime, after the first search, I told you that Joe and Harlow, they just sold some diamonds and they fled to Florida to hide out. Florida. So they're gone for a few months and then they resurface in late April in order to have another meeting with Grant Roy and Sean Lockhart. <laughs> So they've been hot now until they try to move their business forward. Yes. Okay. After Brian's death, of course, suspicion fell on Sean Lockhart and Grant Roy because of their very public feud with Brian Kosas. So when police are asking who would want Brian dead, 
every finger pointed at Sean Lockhart. Yeah. Like he has everything to gain from Brian's death. Yeah, and of course that's what's going to happen. Because with Brian dead, Sean Lockhart could continue working in the industry. He was no longer under contract, and he was able to use the Brent Corrigan name. Thank you. Finally, I can uh, you know, reach my full potential as an artist and, and live my best life as Brent Coriander. Yes. Is that right? You will. Okay. You know, there may be Brent Coriander fans out there, so I'm, I'm just going to I'm gonna let it go. Despite advice from an attorney, Sean Lockhart and Grant Roy decided to go ahead and cooperate with law enforcement, and that meant wearing a wire. So at the end of April, Joe and Harlow went to San Diego for a meeting. In La Jolla, Roy, who had no problems wearing the wire, along with Sean, picked them up for lunch at a place called the Crab Catcher Restaurant. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's Which, like I'm sorry, but maybe in this industry, I don't want to catch the crabs is all I'm saying. That's just not a good restaurant name, period. During the meeting, the four agreed to meet the next day at Torrey Pines State Park near Black's Beach, which was a nude beach, so that Sean and Harlow could have a photo shoot together. First, they met at the I Make a Sandwich Diner. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go catch some crabs, and then we're going to do a sexy photo shoot. Yes. I just imagine it's like that... Um, Video for, uh, who was it, Chris Isaac? You know, I don't want to fall in love. Where they're like rolling around in the sand. No, it's a, well, I yeah, I can't do it. want to fall in love. Wicked, what was that? I couldn't Wicked think of games, Wicked girl. Games. Man, I'm you telling tell you, my memory is just like sucks nah, these days. Not nah, that video girl. Helena that, Christensen? Yeah. She's hot. No. I didn't have a lot of exposure to any, you know, material. And that as wicked, a young man? Yeah. She did things to me as a young man, too. <laughs> that Wicked Games video, bro. Shit. No, I thought she was smoking hot. Yeah. I was like, damn, do I like boys or do I like girls? Or, or do I, I like that. her? Yeah, <laughs> totally. And I was like, Chris, will you shut up? Because your song is kind of in the middle of the road, but this girl right here crawling around on the beach is low low. Well, I like that song. And I, I do like that song, too. I was just trying to like make it a thing. And I also thought Chris Isaac was kind of hot back then, too. During this meeting, Joe revealed information to Grant Roy, which was captured on the wire. Joe admitted to taking about 55 of Brian's tapes, which he says they watched, then destroyed. He also admitted to seizing the two computer towers and other items like the cameras with the serial number scraped off. Okay. The wire was hidden in Grant Roy's key fob and captured the first admission of guilt on behalf of Joe Correcus. Can I say it's a great place to hide a wire? Correcus noted that Brian Kosas had prepared a contract for Harlow when he arrived and was already prepared to line him up with other Cobra actors. So at this like very first meeting at the house before yeah. he falls victim. Yeah, he's all business. He's trying to do the thing. I got this fresh talent. Um, he's probably trying to shake off all that mess with Sean. You know, very public, online, all this. And he just wants to move forward and make some money. And, and he's Yeah, and he sees this hot guy, Harlow, is like his new cash cow. Later, there was an argument about whether Harlow had been inside Brian's house alone or if Joe had been more involved. But Harlow insisted that someone else burst into the house, murdering Brian in front of him. That's his story <laughs> later when he's arrested. No. Now, investigators <laughs> felt the amount of overkill involved in the murder was key to Harlow's admission that he had been a, a victim as a child, that he had been molested. As if he had substituted Brian for the man who had harmed him as a child. Okay. And that when he went in there and like killed him, that he just sort of lost it and went all out rage. I mean, he was stabbed 28 times. Well, no. Nearly it, decapitated. Yeah. I actually almost forgot that because you opened with that horrible scene, obviously. And, and uh, yeah, when you have overkill, it's usually um, personal. And, and so yeah, that makes sense. Because um, he really doesn't have this personal connection to Brian, but to replace him um, with his abuser. I've recently started watching Criminal Minds, and I can just hear like the behavioral analysis unit like talking about this unsub. Ah. Like it's a rage. The unsub? Yeah. Is that your subconscious? Sure. Oh, is that your subscriber? Okay. So on the wire, Harlow could be heard apologizing 
for not thinking everything through so that fingers wouldn't be pointed at Sean Lockhart. Ah. Like Harlow was apologizing and was like, I'm so sorry about that. I never meant for people to point the finger at you or to blame you for this guy's murder. Okay. That you really wanted to happen. Exactly. (laughs) The two men were arrested in May as they made their way to Boston Market to eat lunch. Apparently that was Joe's favorite restaurant and they ate there quite often. Back in the day, for a minute there, Boston Market was all right. But, you know, I always thought it was weird because you could get like this full holiday meal, like on a, you know, 12 o'clock on a Thursday. I know. I'm saying, man, back in the day, I'd be like, ooh, meatloaf and mashed potatoes. Yeah. (laughs) I'll have some ham and macaroni, I guess. A second search warrant was executed in conjunction to that RICO case where more items were seized and turned over to Pennsylvania authorities. News of Harlow and Joe's arrest made front page news. Their assets were seized, and Joe's father tried to help raise money for their defense teams. Porn actor Jason Ridge and Danny Vox tried to help raise money. Jason for the Ridge? Two. Wow. Dude, he's hot. Is he? He's be- So you know some of these gay Jason porn guys. Ridge is like, he's a beautiful man. Well, shit. Tell us how you really feel. No, I'm just saying, like, he's really, he's very pretty. I'm going to look. I saw him on a documentary, Dylan. I bet you did. I did. While they sat in jail, their Norfolk mail escort business crumbled. Well, yeah, it was already, I mean. It was on shaky ground. It was tenuous already, right? In a twist of fate, Sean Lockhart was a key witness for the state against Harlow Kuwandra. Joe refused to testify at Harlow's trial, though he had taken a plea bargain admitting his role in the murder. A mountain of evidence painted an overwhelming conclusion of guilt from the Yahoo email address, the rental car, the cell phone pings off of these towers just by Brian's house, the pawn shop purchases, trails of receipts, and audio recordings. The signs that say we did it. So this dude right here you think is pretty? Yeah. Yeah, he's a pretty dude. You know he's pretty. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Jason Ridge, huh? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. He's very pretty. And that's a good name, too. Yeah. What? Hold on. (laughs) I'm just kidding. Fucking do it. Joe was given life in prison without parole, taking the death penalty off the table. Key pieces of evidence told jurors the means in which Harlow had murdered Brian and Harlow's story had kind of changed over time. So in the beginning, he said Joe was not involved. But by the time of the trial, Harlow was blaming Joe. And saying the murder was all his idea. It's funny how that works. He was desperate for money. He was trying to build this business. He didn't want me escorting. It was all Joe. Right. Jurors took only three hours and 45 minutes to make up their mind. Had to get lunch. Guilty. (laughs) He was given life in prison without parole. Could the jury foreman do that? Be like, not only are you fabulous, you're also guilty. Maybe. That'd be awesome. Sean Lockhart continued denying his role in the murder or that he had planted the seeds. <laughs> this guy. His porn career continues, though in the wake of the murder, sales did drop significantly. Good, because this guy's a dick, no pun intended. Bright's family has been outspoken about Sean Lockhart. And how he's tried to paint himself as the victim in all of this, citing that no, Brian was a victim the whole time. And you victimized him as well when you lied to him. Right. When you dragged his name through the mud, when, you know, you planted the seeds for the murder, you know, you're not the victim here. He is. You're still alive. (sighs) But, and that's what a manipulative person would do try to twist it back into their favor or their their benefit. Now, Brian's family does not believe that Sean was directly involved in the murder, but they do say that his rhetoric online created hatred towards Brian, which was a catalyst for the murder. Well, I think what they feel and say, if I'm to get this right, is if mine is Sean, the murder doesn't happen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Right. And that's how I feel, too. And I think that Sean is incredibly manipulative and though he was not directly involved in this murder he knew exactly what he was doing and he saw these two guys and thought these chumps are so desperate 
and maybe not the brightest guys in the room and I can manipulate them into committing a murder and I'm going to get what I want out of it and they'll take the fall. I don't get it. I think he was like a mastermind behind the whole thing. Well, no, I get that. But I just don't get anyone who goes in what they uh, pretend to be a business meeting. And they're just like, you know, we can do this, guys. You know, you can make money. I can make money. Everything's happy. But you're going to have to go kill this guy to make it work. We got to get him out of the picture. I mean, if only something, if only we could get him out of the picture. Well, the thing is, he was going to be out of the picture because Brian was working on a settlement with Sean Lockhart. Right. It would allow him to get a small percentage of his videos. Some using, kind of a royalty. Like, yes. Or like a using user, the name yeah. like Brent Corrigan. Yeah. Or a licensing fee, rather. Right. Okay. So he was going to make a little money off of him, but Sean was going to be able to go off on his own and do his thing and use that name. But see, he didn't even want to have to give up a little bit of money. <laughs> I'm telling you, he's a piece of work. This dude, what what's his what's his last name? Sean Lockhart. Sean Lockhart. I want to see him. Is he pretty as this dude right here? I don't think so. Let me see. Now, porn keeps growing and is estimated now to be about a about a twelve billion dollar a year industry. That's a lot. So, can you imagine now with the way pornography is so accessible on the internet and it's so based on the internet, you know, internet based business and you have all these websites and stuff. Brian Kosas potentially could have been making like so much money at this point. This him right here? Yeah, honey, that's him. Jason Ridge is prettier than that dude. I know. Man, I'm, I, I gate it up for I this episode. You. I am just I'm not afraid to say what I think. No, I don't think Sean Lockhart's that hot. Nah. He's not my type. <sighs> Look at Brent Oleander or whatever. Fuck, dude. Brent he has no imagination to. You made up a name, and that's what you picked. I'm sorry. Well, he didn't, though. Brian picked it. Well, whoever made the name up, it's just like, what is that even supposed to be? I don't know. Brian's reasoning for choosing that particular name, according to his lawsuit, was because it sounded Irish. <laughs> <laughs> He thought it was a very Irish sounding name and liked it. Okay. Well, there you go. But you know, I'm not making the name up. Who am I to tell him what name to make up, right? You was talking about you want to be buck naked. Buck naked, dude. Or Pistol Pete. No Pistol Pete. What? That's stupid. You think that's, well, that's like a basketball player or some shit. That's a pretty dumb name. Buck naked. But I have to say, uh, actor Tommy Pistol. See, what the shit in hell? Me, yeah. Is this what's happening? What? When I'm at work? <laughs> Who says you're when at you're... work? <laughs> oh. This just <laughs> happens when you're ignoring me all the time at home. You cold bitch. I don't ignore you. I'm you... ignoring you when I'm doing the dishes? <laughs> you ignore me all the time. The fuck? <laughs> Dylan every day will be like texting me, I can't wait to see oh, you. Oh, this is a lie forthcoming. This is so true. I can't <sighs> wait to see you. Oh, we're going to hang out. I love you so much. It's true. And then he gets home and sits down next to me for like 15 minutes. And the rest of the evening, he's smoking. Then he has to go to the store for 30 minutes to buy cigarettes. That's not true. And then he's smoking again. And then he takes like his hour and a half shower and he primps. Sh shower and shave. You're like fluffing yeah. your beard and like putting balms in it and oils and things. I don't right? have, I don't even have a beard kit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm seriously like have an underprivileged beard right now. And she's totally painting the, um, yeah, look, and then, I want to get and clean. Then, yeah. You'll wash dishes because I've cooked dinner, right? I'm and, just trying and, to help and then the you'll household. Be like, Oh, well, I'm going to take Rufus for a walk and then you'll go walk Rufus up and the street smoke and cigarette. smoke. Well, yeah, dog's got to pee. And then you come back and you'll be another 45 minutes. Cause you'll be like, well, I had to go to the bathroom after I ate. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like baby but then, you know what then i'll go to bed and you'll be like i'm coming right up and then i'll watch the clock and then like an hour later you finally come to bed and then you get up from bed to go smoke and poop again and then you come back to bed and i'm just like what, what is fuck? wrong with you why do you love me i don't know No, but look you know what's happening this is a truth you, right look, here you're just like the the shittiest <laughs> smoking, smoking. i'm a smoky mouth bitch is what you're saying you're right a, sh a smoky mouth bitch who shits constantly because uh, i swear you spend so much time in the bathroom look i'm gonna be honest with you a lot of time i'm just trying 
You think I'm kidding about the all day poos? I mean, there there are steps to some of this. Maybe I need some brand in my life. But you know what? My truth is, this entire thing. This uh, maybe you should stop with the monsters, okay? And and trade the monster energy drink that she was slurping on before we got. I'm gonna finish this son of a bitch right here on and mic. Get yourself some brand, okay? Get you some grape nuts, Dylan. Quit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't know that would come through that good. Oh, it's got Oh, that went in my nose. You know it does because you do it all the time. You make these <laughs> slurpy sounds in the microphone. So this entire time I'm living this life that you're these falsehoods that you're putting forth to the public. I love you. While I'm I'm loving well, I'm you. I'm just saying. I'm loving while you're you. ignoring me in the bathroom for like 6 of the 8 hours you're home from working your 12-hour shift and you're not sleeping and snoring in my ear. Um, Can I say you're, working? You're ignoring me. Working twelve so, hour swings is traumatic. So what am I going to do but stalk Tommy Pistol on Instagram? Tommy Pistol and Jason Ridge. Yeah, I'm going to see what Tommy Pistol fucking look like now, dude. And while we're at it, why wow, this we, is my my history is getting interesting. Okay, we have to talk about this real quick mm -hmm. since we had a whole episode about gay porn. Is wait, we were talking about gay porn. If <laughs> you want to see something incredible, there is a website called lurididigs.com. L U R I D and then the word digs.com. And it is a curated collection of photos of men. This dude take, yeah, for real, yeah, he's so dude. Cool. Okay, oh you're, you're not listening to me. Okay. okay, look, don't be jealous of Tommy. I'm trying to tell you a story here, Dylan. Oh, I, ain't, I ain't telling. I'm cuter than that dude. Lauradigs.com, okay? It is a curated collection of photos of gay men, and, and they're nude. So I'm just going to say, you know, if you don't want to see, like, dicks and balls, you probably shouldn't look at the site. But it's so funny because it's them, like, with self-portraits. Okay. But it's in these tacky rooms. And so the whole premise is to laugh about the horribly decorated rooms in the background. That's why it's called Lurid Digs. Because ah. you've got these terrible rooms, but then you'll have like a, you know, like a naked man standing in the middle of the room that's like a kid's can like a little girl's bedroom with like a canopy and like purple satin pillows and like unicorns everywhere, but it's like some dude posing. Okay. Or like in this terrible living room with like plastic on the furniture, like it's his mom's house or his granny's house, but he's like, like, you know, sexy posed on the couch with the plastic cover on it. I always wondered who could sit on that couch and be comfortable. I don't know, but it is an amazing site. I had a, a coworker years ago who turned me on to the site. She's like, you got to see this. It's the best. Lurid Diggs. Lurid Diggs. Laura Diggs. Lurid. L U R I D. I've spelled it for you already. That's what I said. During the episode, you called it Laura Diggs. No, the second time I said it, I said or or Laura. Lurid. 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 Dylan. <laughs> Man, when this monster kick in, dude, you're gonna catch hell. I'm about to kick you in your little leg or some shit. If you can catch me, I ain't scared of you. I'll cash you outside. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make you look at Laura Diggs. Okay, I want to see these now. Oh, no, it's amazing. So I'm just saying, you know, if you're not afraid of a little dick, you got to go oh, wait, check it out. It's, well, it's yeah. hilarious. It's the best. It's the best thing I've ever seen. Okay. And you're wrong. Tommy Pistol is cute. He's the, I'm sorry, he's not. I don't care what you think. Well, that's what I think. I think he's hot. Jason Ridge was cute. Jason Ridge is hot. He's pretty. He's beautiful. Yeah. And all these dudes is like cuter than the old dude in the story. Let's be honest. I don't know. You Not don't, Tommy Pistol. You don't find Sean Lockhart to be cute. Sean Lockhart is almost cuter than Tommy Pistol, though. I don't care what you say. Okay? <laughs> Who are you to judge? You have a big head. You know what? I was about to say ain't none of these dudes' heads big as mine. For real. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> and that's the fucking truth. Yeah, you do have a big head. 100. Whatever. I know about... Your Lana Rhodes obsession. Don't even try to. Who is that? With me. 
Yeah. Uh, oh, What's her name? On. Lana or Lana? I don't know. What are you even talking about? That brunette with the big booty that you like, and then you would be like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, I'm not stupid. Okay. I don't know porn Thanks actresses Thanks for emailing names. us at mountainmurderspodcast at gmail.com. We do have quite a nice collection of listener stories, so we will be getting that episode out very soon. <laughs> uh, also, Dylan is full of shit, so if you would like to write in and let it be know how full of shit your partner is, uh, now's a good time to do that. Um, what else, Dylan? What do what we got going on? Oh, let's go ahead. This is going to be funny. Let's thank Wendy again for being today's sponsor of this episode. Yeah. She is responsible for this episode coming it's out. It's all your fault, Wendy. <laughs> the tangents, oh. Dylan's excitable mood. My unbridled enthusiasm. All you need to... the big dicks. Yeah, there were some big dicks. Uh, every some bit, kind of big Every dicks. bit of it. Um, it's it's all that big to Wendy's me. fault. And, and you, now Wendy is no longer a patron. And you know who's waiting in the wings? I'll go ahead and say it, of Wendy's guys who have these huge slongs who can't like really even get them up. You know who's waiting in the shadows? Us dude with regular size, very hard penises. That we waiting to go ahead and You waiting for what? What you gonna do? To smoke and drink a monster <laughs> no, and like just, we're, spend forty five minutes at a time in the bathroom like six times an evening. Yeah. I mean, come on, dude. Looking like a damn Baby holding a plum. Look, a baby hand holding a plum. I don't know. Let's go. What? <laughs> Nothing. I don't know. That's very inaccurate. A blue vein throbber. And That's also, what I meant. Okay. I'm going to throw up in my mouth now. And also, <laughs> Dylan, um, I don't know when you're supposed to be like X trying to give it to somebody because you spend too much time in this shitter. Okay. Bye.